Welcome to another episode of Into the West podcast. My name is Charles. With me today are Richard, Ian, and we have a very special guest. It is Harry from the Entmoot podcast. Woo! <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> thanks for thanks for asking me, guys. Appreciate it. We're doing another bracket episode today, and this is a sequel to our last one, which is the top 16 good heroes. So following that, we're going to be doing the top 16 evil heroes. So we have Harry with us today to uh, talk a little bit about that. If you've been following podcasts for MESBG or following uh, YouTube channels, you, you'll know the Ant Mood podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about how the Ant Mood's going? Yeah, it's going well, thank you. Uh, so I should have prepared this, but I think I'm on the 86th or something like that episode. Um, uh, yeah, around around 86, 87. So basically the podcast is all about going to tournaments. I, I go along to an event. Um, I sort of uh, talk about my list ahead of time and then uh, then basically put it into practice. So, you know, it's uh, it's not just Theory Hammer. We uh, we do interviews with people while we're playing and, and all that sort of stuff. Get a sense of uh, how how my army that has has achieved or not achieved in the uh, and the games of the tournament via uh, sort of discussions with the with the five or six or uh, fewer or or maybe slightly more players that I go go up against. So that's the gist. I've been going strong for a few years now, and uh, yeah, I'm still I'm still loving it, and and hopefully people uh, people are still enjoying it. Uh, where I put the old battle report and various other different sort of whatever sort of floats my boat at the time. So yeah, just try and. Uh, Try and support the old hobby, and I'm uh, in the management committee for the Great British Hobbit League, so I'm the marketing coordinator for that as well. So uh, I write up a lot of blogs and and talk about um, you know the goings on uh, in the biggest league, uh, MESBG league in the world. So yeah, yeah we should busy. definitely get you back for uh, maybe the 2024 uh, league review. <laughs> mm, I would, yeah. I, I'd, I'd be well up for that. Yeah, yeah, because it's fascinating. I'm, I, I'm not one of those top players, um, uh, but. I do really enjoy watching um, uh, sort of discussions about all the various tournaments that have happened and, and just seeing how the lists are developing and the meta's changing and all this sort of stuff. As a big follower of your podcast for a long time, I do have like a fan question. You say like you're not really like a top player, but I've noticed, <laughs> no spoilers, you've been doing better and better recently. Mm. So do you find like um, having to interview your opponents and like get into like the strategy and tactics help you become a better player? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, I think, I think generally two things that it helps do is, is if you've had a, a game where it's been really tense, you know, sometimes you, you have, have those sort of slightly contentious moments in games. And then at the end of it, you go, oh, okay, thanks. Sir. And then you, you sort of head off and, and that's it. It, it can leave, pot potentially have that sort of slight, overhang or hangover of the tension still uh, if you sort of bump into them again in a future tournament or even just uh, at the bar or whatever later on but having that conversation that eight minute ten minute whatever it is conversation really sort of reminds them and you that, that that was just a game and now we can be friends again you know which is which is not one of the best things i found because it it really sort of uh, undoes all that tension if there was any but two yeah i i, I learn an awful lot and i think you're, you're right i am getting a bit better at the game i've sort of got my first podiums in the last uh, uh, last sort of six months basically i think i've got two podiums which i'm very proud of now i think just just talking through those games and and asking someone some just quite a simple question of was there anything I could have done to win that game, or was there anything I could have done better, or or whatever is 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 really really helpful? Because especially when you got the board right in front of you, you know they can say, oh yeah, well if you'd have chosen to deploy there and gone through that gap, and you know that sort of stuff, it it can really help. And um, I realise sometimes that doesn't necessarily help listeners when I'm starting to talk about the gap uh, six inches between uh, uh, you know two ruins or whatever. But I try and uh, try and paint a picture for everyone. So I definitely I definitely agree that is. That is true. Harry is, I think, played almost <clears throat> everything. If you just watch his channel, he even has a, a video where he plays a thousand points of ruffians. Like, yes, not many people can say they've done that. And quickly they sniped out Sharky. Not a great start. But then the ruffians collided. The two flanks sent up to capture the objectives and plenty more uh, heading off towards the central objective while the rangers engaged. But of course, rangers engaging against ruffians, they quickly chop through. And they did manage to kill a few special characters, including poor old Bill Fernie. <laughs> it took a very, very long time to paint those. I did a whole community uh, project. And you know what? It was actually quite good. Because, <laughs> like, uh, you know, you've just got, I think it was somewhere in the region of 150, 160 models. And at a thousand points, you just, you know, you, you, you didn't 
you, you got to the stage where you quartered and you still had like 30, 40 models on the board. So you, you've outnumbering still quite a lot of armies. So uh, it actually worked out rather well. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, though. <laughs> Well, glad to have you here to talk to about Evil Heroes today. Before we get started, I just want to uh, shout out the sponsor of our video, which is Baron of Dice. They make some great dice for miniature wargaming. Uh, please go check their products out on their website. You can use a promo code WEST for 5% off your order. And also want to give a quick thank you to all of our patrons over on Patreon. Thank you all for supporting the show. And if you would like to see videos early and extra content and other perks, check out our um, Patreon in the link. So the bracket, how it works is we are going to have the top 16 evil heroes picked by us and also the community go head to head. And we're going to determine the best evil hero in the game. So what we did was out of the 16 heroes, four were chosen by the community and out of the four of us, each of us have made three picks for a total of 16. So we're going to go first go over what the community picked. And uh, we put polls up on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Discord. And we ask everyone what who they thought were the best evil heroes. So this was the result. Will there be contention in the top five? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bottom five. <laughs> Look at that. <clears throat> the community gets to pick first. So, you know, they get first dibs out of all the evil heroes. <laughs> we have it graphed out. You can see some of the top picks Witch King, Solidan, Dragon Emperor, Azog, Gulivar, Shagrat, Spider Queen, Barrow White. And then it kind of drops down quite a bit only a several votes each. So of course, we're only taking the top four community votes. But we can kind of see here how the votes were distributed. So Witch King by a landslide. Mm. <laughs> so 65 is insane. So I just want to also note that we put up this poll before the FAQ drop, the Dragon Emperor nerf. So this is pre-nerf at 45 votes. I wonder if we had taken the poll today, which is when the FAQ came out, if we would have different results. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't think we would. <laughs> <laughs> I still think he's uh, he's pretty good at the at plus thirty points. You know, I can't see him dropping. Uh, he might drop below Azog on that that list, but I don't. I can't. I don't see him not being in the top four. Still, personally, I think he'd still be in the top four. Mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, yeah, this is the full list here. I have some interesting picks. Some smaller heroes near the bottom. We got Smog. We got Sauron. Like Carrie mentioned, um, you know, your favorite there. Yeah, there's a couple interesting picks near the end. So we have Raza and Razgoosh. Really? Those are yeah. interesting. Bill Fernie. I don't know if I would agree with those, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then. The interesting, I, I'm surprised actually that the Shadow Lords only got the one vote. That used to be a, 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 a sort of ever present, um, which is really surprising. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, with the prevalence of shooting armies now, mm. that is kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. Also, is Bill Fernie the one who can set things on fire? Or is that something no, else? They can subtract one dice out of a Maelstrom roll that your enemy does. He was in the finals for Worst Hero episode. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, you guys um, as a community have improved. So when we took the Good Heroes poll, I think there was like eight evil heroes being listed. So this time there was only two, uh, Glorfindel and Lake Town Captain. So I think that's an improvement in listening to the instructions. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> okay, so now on to, I guess, our picks. So I have a community picks listed. They are the top seeds because they got a pick first. So we went through four community picks. Uh, do you guys have any more comments? Uh, so the Witch King, for obvious reasons. And then we have Suladan. We have the Dragon Emperor. And then we have Azog. And I assume Azog is taken from Pits of Dol Guldur, is what people are thinking when they voted this. I think he should, well, be somewhere on this list, like with Pits of Dol Guldur bonus, 
or like with the Master of Battle and the Legion, like with the, mm-hmm. his normal Azox Legion. Fight seven and six might is pretty solid. And then you add in the fact that he can wound heroes on a three plus no matter what. It's he 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 can chew chew up stuff pretty easily. Yeah, I think these picks, these four picks were all kind of predictable, just seeing as how common uh, these were in the competitive scene over the last year or so. Number four, I thought maybe Gulivar would would be higher, but that's all one. <laughs> the top three, though, Witch King, Suladan, and Dragon Emperor, I definitely expected to be there. I, I'm not saying that one of the three will for sure win, but I think that they're all definitely contenders for uh, the best evil hero and just for their sheer value and versatility to be in so many different kind of lists. Mm, yeah, the presence of uh, of Azog um, probably indicates more of people thinking of uh, you know, best evil hero being someone who is likely to do well in a fight. Um, I don't know how, uh, I, I think I saw uh, one of the polls that you put up on, uh, it was a YouTube poll that I saw. And if you just give people quite a wide thing like best evil hero, um, I guess they can choose anything. So, you know, I've gone with someone like uh, Grimmer because he adds quite a lot of utility, but uh, he can't lead any troops. But, you know, there's uh, other other things on the list which, you know, uh, like the mercenary captain who is uh, obviously adds a, a, a massive amount to to an army, but, you know, would would be absolutely awful in a, a straight up fight, the same with the Barrow White. So, so uh, Azog being one of those kind of heroes that, that can bring A, lots of troops to the table, B, as really helpful bus for the surrounding troops, like your big standfast that affects Orc heroes and, and also his killing potential. I can cer- certainly see why people have gone gone for him uh, in the top four um, over something like, for example, a Barrow White, who is just incredible value, which we'll probably talk about in a second. Yeah, I'm 100% with you, Harry. I think our podcast, especially, and maybe probably most competitive-minded players, we do Mm. look at value rather than just straight-up absolute raw power because then then it's always going to be Smog or the Balrog, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, So, yeah, I think that's definitely... you know our criteria but yeah i understand like it, it yeah, can be open ended it, it's sad to not see the balrog and sauron uh, <laughs> on the list or smaug <laughs> but still maybe i should have chosen those three they, those are the sorts of ones that i i would instinctively go for for, for the lols <laughs> uh not sure they would make it out of the first round but yeah definitely <laughs> fun <laughs> and then next we got harry as the guest to pick so mm-hmm. the ones with h in brackets maybe harry you can go through your picks and why you think these sure are sure the so here. i'll caveat this with um the fact that I, I wanted to choose left field um picks because i know you guys are probably going to fill out the the ranks with with some of the top things so i mean there are a couple of ones that i wanted to put in but decided against it because i suspected you would go for them uh anyway and that is the barrow white in particular and um and Gulivar. yes they are still on there mm-hmm. so so that's good and so i correctly thought because i wanted to fill in some uh, left field choices so i chose grimmer wormtong gothmog and the mummock war leader so grimmer being just 25 points um i think he's he's one of those heroes although obviously he can't lead troops and and there's a lot of stuff around him the the value he ha- adds to a an isengard army and and the stuff that you can do with him and the frustration that he causes against the opponents i think if you're including saruman in your army he's basically an auto pick i think if you've got isengard um he's almost always uh, or should almost always be there if you've got a Saruman as well so I think he's great great value for that that effect that he brings and obviously um his his downside is magic but you've got probably the best caster in the game against him a, a spell caster you can always whack him in uh, Saruman's warband and Saruman can do some nasties to the uh, the opposing spell caster and uh, Grimmer can then start to do some work later in the game pulling away might points and and stuff like that so I think he's really cool for that Second one was Gothmog. Uh, Gothmog being, I think, just just one of those all round utility orc heroes that I I 
I, I find it hard to replace him in a Mordor army when I do uh, uh, when I do play Mordor because he's got uh, the Master of Battle is is just so powerful uh, and he's you know relatively cheap. He's high defense. But he gives all those buffs to the the warriors in his vicinity for killing the Age of Men is over and the um, time of the Orc and all that sort of stuff. So um, and with, at the moment with the with uh, there being quite a lot of men armies around, you know, your Easterlings, your uh, your Black Numenorean front line and just the late towns and uh, Numenor and uh, in the last alliance there's just quite a lot of men kicking about uh, I do I do really rate Gothmog for for that reason he adds quite a lot and and in the legion he's pretty cool as well I like the that the sort of super buffs that he gets uh, from that so that was why I went with Gothmog and finally the moment war leader um Probably not one that most people would expect but I would I would bet you any of these sort of uh, eight matches we've got lined up here i bet you if uh the mummock war leader and any one of the other were head to head in contest of champions the mummock war leader would kill the other one before they had a chance uh to survive so he it, just in terms of raw output of uh of killing power yes he's 400 points but he absolutely smashes through stuff um and the the special rules that he gives um mummocks just give them that little bit more exciting uh killing potential in um uh, particularly in the legion that he's part of them um, with, with the free heroic strike against the enemy leader uh, and the free heroic combats which is just absolutely outrageous um when you when you uh when you put it like that it, you know mummock with uh strength four strength nine trample hits uh, the 10 wounds and all that sort of stuff so so yeah I, those are the, the reasons i have gone with those ones very very interesting i'm mm -hmm. looking forward to see how it does <laughs> i think there's some that i agree with there some that i'm not sure I, I might need to hear more. <laughs> Fair enough. Do you have any comments for Harry's picks? Grima, yes. I think that's a great pick. I just love the utility from Grima and then the presence of that. And I always love some like sneaky trick, you know, that you can do that people aren't really used to playing. That's always a plus. But I think the one that threw me off guard is Gothmog. That's always to me been kind of a... Um, like not bad but more like a mid-tier Mordor hero I, I get Mordor has so many choices but he's just he's just left behind by so many of the new orc heroes too it's just you don't see him too much in the competitive scene and I think there's a reason to that yeah you're probably right I think that the the um Shagrats and the Goths of the world to probably overtake him a little bit in terms of sort of uh, point for point killing power and stuff, but I I just I just like a bit of goth mark. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, after Harry, I picked the Spider Queen, which for obvious reasons I I feel like any model that is constantly thrown in to yellow alliances when people are choosing to forego their army bonuses, you know you know that's a good model. She's just amazing at pretty much all objective scenarios. Her only weakness is being squishy, but she has like heroic defense. So I really love her. And then we have next, the mercenary captain, just the utility on that. Maybe not the biggest and strongest hero, but that and the watcher are two of the only models that have this unique ability of deploying anywhere on the board. My next pick is kind of controversial, I think, or I got some looks from my co-hosts when I talked about this one but the generic ring wraith i think they're just really really solid value and most of the time you're going to see them as the budget version so as cheap as you can get and just seven will throw some transfix and you get the harbinger of evil still yeah just really good value and and if you take one then you don't have to take a captain for the march uh yeah any thoughts on my picks yeah, they're all great. All three are great utility pieces. You know, Spire Queen has the unique uh, broodlings that no, no one else in the game really has. Well, the Dragon Emperor can kind of dismount and have a similar ability, but not as versatile, not not as mobile as a Spider Queen. Mercenary Captain, which is like good at so many scenarios. And then also, um, like you said, the Ring Wraith being a really great support hero. So I, I think I like... The representation here for support heroes because i i mm. think that a good hero isn't always like the biggest beat stick and i actually would pick these three over a lot of the heroes here even some that i chose 
Yeah, the um, I, I really like the inclusion of the the budget ring wraith um, there because I you know it's one I, I've included him in a couple of my Mordor lists um, and and it just adds so much having the the ability to um, assassinate targets with black darts um, even with just a couple just to put put that pressure on and having also having a really high courage. Um, hero for your standfast um, in the late game with, when you've got a lot of orcs about can be really really helpful. Also, just like the cheap negative one courage bubble, mm. especially with the prevalence of black Numenorean spam, like it's yeah, it works really well in our really handy end game, aren't they? Ring race. All right, so I'll go with my picks next. So my first pick is the Mahood King, and mm. this is I, I in my opinion the best unnamed hero in the game probably and you you just get so much hitting power close to that of like a dane iron foot on pig in a hero that's under 100 points and because of that reason in a lot of competitive lists you'll see more than one of these and uh in a in a past faq they've been upgraded to hero valor so they can also mm -hmm. lead 15 troops in their warband so they can pretty much make up all of your heroes in an army. It's, it's great if you want to ally in Serpent Horde in a pure list, but but yeah, they're they're good on their own. And then I picked uh, Watcher in the Water. I, I know on our podcast, Richard probably has the most experience with this model, but I've played some games with it myself. The ability to grab models out of base contact and pull them to you, being able to shoot into combat without rolling in the ways that that is something that is like, no other model in this game can do and just a really great assassin and also being able to appear anywhere on the board uh, and then finally i picked dalamir i think that he's a lot of the time overlooked because he doesn't have any like impressive rules but he is super efficient he's under 100 points he's um, a great assassin and also a great leader a hero of legend for that chief of a cost he can help a corsair list spam out really easily and he just, I think he brings a lot for not much more than like the cost of a mid-tier hero and when he's way above that. So those are my picks. I mean, I'm sure we'll get into the other the other picks because uh, they speak for themselves and we see them a lot anyway, but I just want to focus on Dalamir because I think he, I think you're right. He is, he is kind of like underrepresented on these lists, but like, like you said, considering his points cost, he is very efficient in just getting warband slots in there. And also considering his points cost, he, he is no slouch in combat, right? He can still grind out a couple troops each turn, no problem, or go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy heroes, at least for a couple turns, like, well, as might last out. So, yeah, he's definitely really solid. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm right in thinking he's got three fate, is that right? Or Yeah, so so he, he, he can be surprisingly hard to kill after, uh, even with the big heroes. And the Hero of Legend um, thing for Corsairs is... Is such a big deal, isn't it? Like ha having a hero of legend. And a, it means you can ally in someone like your Suladan or whatever, which um, and not force Suladan to be a leader, which uh, is handy. The Watcher is a great choice as well. And um, I, I would, I would sort of say, you know, obviously the Watcher is only really very good if you've got a bat in in company with him. But but still, yeah, he's he's pretty cool. All right, Ian, your picks. So, kind of like last time, my picks. I basically made my list kind of after everybody had already made theirs and submitted their their choices. And then I so I just kind of looked at what was on my list and what hadn't been picked and just kind of went with the top three. But, you know, I'm still happy with the choices. I was amazed Gully hadn't made it on the list mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. He's like similar to the Watcher. He just, when he's on the table, it forces your opponent to change the way they play the game in a huge way. Because if they don't, He's just gonna eat him up and destroy your whole army. Like pick off all your big heroes and then just eat through troops at his leisure. And then the next one, I guess I picked who's maybe more controversial, maybe less. I don't know. Uh Rutabi. Just overall so solid for the points cost. And I think she would get more attention if it wasn't for Mr. Emperor, who's just so powerful and well, formerly undercosted for what he brought. Uh, that she kind of just kind of slipped in there and everybody ignored her, but she's still very efficient. I, honestly, I, I was debating her or Amdor, and she just kind of pipped it out, but we'll, we'll get into that. And then my last choice, I mean, a Barrel White had to be on there. It's just Paralyze is, is arguably the best spell in the game. It's We're fortunate that it's only on one model, but damn, is that model cheap and very, like, works incredibly well in the armor list. So 
feel like they all just kind of slotted in there to to round out the list. Great choice. The Barrow White in particular is is such a great choice. You get so much for those fifty points, don't you? Like it, it's crazy. The the five or potentially five paralyzed spells, high defense, high courage hero in an army that needs it. The the terror but the terror buff thing, even like blades for dead and and two wounds. It's like there's just so much in there. Just makes pretty much every every other sort of um, mini hero in in Angmar completely redundant. Yeah, Angmar is all about the heroes, so definitely needed to add more Angmar heroes mm-hmm. to this list. Rutabi is the one that I'm I'm unsure about because yeah, because when 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 you're facing a uh, host of dragon emperor, it's mostly your your focus is on the emperor. So I would have to think about that one. Not saying that. Um, I don't like that pick, but I have to think about it a little bit as we go. Yeah, and even when it comes to the Dragon Emperor Legion, a lot of the times I see the second hero being Brogreer. So I I don't know if that's an argument against Rutabi. So I know uh, Harry brought up a few of his own runner-ups. Do any of us into the West crew have any runner-ups that you would like to shout out quickly? Like if oh. you had a fourth pick? I think the only thing that was left off my list was Bolg, but to be fair, I did say Azog or Bolg, because I think they both kind of fill the same-ish role. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy one of them made it on. Mostly just because, like, the Fight 7 Master Battle is, like, crazy. And then you add in the fact that either of them just has crazy damage output. Like, they they, they can do very similar things. Um, Yeah, I was really surprised to to not see Bolg on this list as well. Mm Mm-hmm. I think um I think some of the mid tier like Mordor heroes are all like pretty insane. So we have like Kardish for like just an insane shaman. We have Guritz, which is like a better Madril. And then we have uh Gorbeg too, like just a value fighter. So yeah, I think all those are pretty good. Yeah, and um Shagrat's not here either. Um, again, uh, another another mid tier mortal hero who you see certainly here in the UK on a lot of top tables or uh, in a lot of the uh, the mix for for those big mortal armies that do well. Yeah, uh, the only one I was also going to mention is uh, Lingering Shadow. I think in a lot of um, Azog's Legion Dogal Door lists, you'll see this wraith being the first wraith to take. Uh, sometimes even before Witch King for the the little teleport ability that it has to move around and grab objectives and stuff like that. Mm. It's also sad not to see Sauron. I think bad. <laughs> <laughs> Should so... have chosen him myself. It's my fault. <laughs> Could probably swap him out for Gothmog, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so should we get into round one? Yeah. So in round one of the... Evil Heroes bracket, we have the Witch King of Angmar against the Barrow White. Mm. So I think it's unfortunate that the Barrow White got pushed down to the last seed because uh, I feel like it should be higher because obviously the Witch King is amazing. And even in this in that list, the Witch King is the kingpin. You can probably build a list without the Barrow White, but a Witch King list Angmar is, uh, you are usually pretty not competitive so it's a sad duel that isn't it because the witch king (laughs) just has so much versatility you can have him you know up somewhere around 200 points with a with a fell beast and a the crown and and you know all the will in the world and you can also have him at like nearly you know around 100 points with a few points of might and very little will and you know a couple of points of fate and 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 just a horse so it's just it's just a shame that uh, the barrow white is so good and yeah you don't really want to pit them together uh, in this fight straight away, but sadly, I think the Witch King does come out on top in my book. Yeah, even yeah. even even if you argue that they're equal in Engmar, the Witch King is also amazing in Mordor. So mm. I yeah, mean, he's he's kind of a top tier hero in multiple armies, and uh, also the Black Riders Legendary Legion. So <laughs> I think the Witch King takes this one. Yeah, they they both are very good. I think, it, well, it, it kind of comes down to the Barrow White works well, works best with the Witch King because he can sap will or just reduce enemy hero spells. And also, you can live without a Barrow White in an Angmar list, 
you want to have the Witch King if for nothing else for the compel because the compel sets up Gully to go do things or murder or whatever. It just mm -hmm. yeah, it just works better with the list. Not to say that the Barrel White doesn't, but yeah, like you said, it is an unfortunate matchup, but a fair one maybe. All right, first round is a sweep then. It's a community pick. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next matchup we have is the Spider Queen versus the Mercenary Captain. And both are my picks. So mm -hmm. no matter what, you always come out. Whittles me top. down. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll let you guys go first since uh, it's like picking between two children of mine. So I don't know. My children! My children! <laughs> you still have a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> They both provide a utility of uh, mobility and uh, objective capturing. They're different in the sense that Spider Queen is also a very great assassin, while the Mercenary Captain is kind of delegated to utility and, and filling that mobility role. Spider Queen is often seen allied, while because the Goblin Mercenary Captain is a hero of fortitude, you only really see it in the triple evil hobbit alliance you don't really see it outside of that they are oh, yeah town. you you also see them in goblin town right but definitely not as um versatile in terms of list building compared to the spider queen it's a close one but i think uh, i think my vote goes to spider queen just because i think it's she's easier to, to get into a list yeah they both are very good but i think when if you're doing a straight up comparison between the two the Merc Captain, his whole thing is he drops in on a terrain piece with probably a warband of, like, including him, like, what, four to six models? The Spider Queen can kind of do that by shooting out three broodlings and having herself. And she also is just tremendous damage output, like, machine, and can bring bat swarms just to make her work, right? Yeah, I, for me, I, it's they're both very good. I don't think it's much of a contest. I think the Spider Queen takes it. Hmm, interesting. I'll be the 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 voice of difference here. I think the Spider Queen does. I, I the Broodlings are uh, a, the thing. The only thing I think she brings over allying in other big hitters into your army. I mean, I, I haven't seen the Spider Queen on um, in top tables uh, or or sort of top lists for quite some time. I think the the the, the value she adds is is diminishing a bit in the meta. Maybe maybe that's just a me me not 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 sort of following it as closely as 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 possible, or maybe because she's not used as much in the UK anymore. But I think a lot of people are bringing in other other heroes that that have a killing output or or do something other than than what the Spider Queen does. Whereas I do see the mercenary captain an awful lot on lists that are doing really well at the moment. Whether uh, you know just adding so much value to those, uh, particularly the Goblin Town and and the Azog Legion list. So I, I just think just because I I see the mercenary captain more, yeah, that I think I'm going to have to go with the mercenary captain. I just think this Spider Queen's too fragile to to really count on as a uh, as a as a support hero. And and the fact that you know you you don't I don't see her as much anymore makes me think maybe the mercenary captain is the winner. But I don't know. I think you make some great points, but I wonder if it might be just down to like the points level. I know in the UK, it seems like you guys tend to play generally maybe a bit smaller games, like six, 500 to 700 maybe. Whereas I think in North America, we do get bigger games. And I think then, even if the Spider Queen is a bit squishy, I think it's a less percentage of your total points mm. cost, right? So if you lose her, it's not the end of the world. I think as good as the mercenary captain is, I I played Spider Queen quite a bit um, the last year or so, and she gives you such a big advantage in so many scenarios. I think it's not even about the killing power. I feel like the killing power is just the added bonus, like the fight six and and all that. I've won like seize the prize in like two turns because of her. She threatens like retrieval. You're going to be hard pressed to lose reconnoiter storm the camp you know so and even in combat as squishy as she is she has heroic defense so i don't know personally i i like rate her maybe as one of the top like if i were to put together like the top four i think she might be in it so mm -hmm. she might be my dark horse here <laughs> so i gotta go with the spider queen fair enough we we did forget to explain the that the guest of the episode count as two votes. So it's <laughs> only a three to two.
Well, no, he's he's <laughs> one vote until it's a tie, and then he gets yeah. the tiebreaker. Oh, right, I'll get the tie. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay so the next round, we have Azog against Dalamir. Ooh, this one's a tough one, I, I think. It's, it's always tough when the two heroes that you're comparing are vastly different in terms of mm-hmm. points. Because uh, Azog is more than double of Dalamir's points, so... And they have uh, some pretty different roles as well. I would say that Azog is most likely your biggest hero and you're going to be relying on him to do a lot of the the heavy lifting, maybe um, the hero assassinating, things like that. Well, while I think Dalamir, even if he doesn't accomplish very much during a game, he's still worth it just because of his cost. And um, a lot of the times you have the, your warriors do the heavy lifting for you because of the backstabbers and Dalamir simply just has to survive and I understand the people who really rate Azog from my experience they're closer than a lot of people might 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 think and I I might lean towards Dalamir just because I have more personal experience with him and also I I think that you you don't rely on him as much as you would rely on Azog and in a list as i'll give you if you have a few bad turns of combat or or whatever then you're 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 gonna fall apart quite quickly aren't you because because uh, you've got so many eggs in that one basket because it's such a big chunk of your points so i can see that point i i just think it's hard to argue with a fight seven six might hero that that has so many not just not just for the combat uh, potential whichever list you're using him in but also the support for the the orcs and the york heroes as well that big stand fast with the the effects orc heroes is 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 pretty cool the the uh you know the terror it's just there's just so many things I, i'd have to back azog in this one i think i'll go with a community pick he's just he's just so good i don't know this is this is tough like I, I really like Dalamir. I've run him a, a lot uh, in, previously, and and like what what makes him good is is the fact he is so cheap, and he he comes lists that he comes with. It's it's usually him, two or three other heroes that are almost the same as him as well. Very similar kind of effectiveness and points cost. At least the way I, I like to run that that alliance uh, mm. in the Corsairs list. So comparing that to one Azog, it's it, they're very different. That being said. When Azog is on the table on the White Warg, he becomes like impossible to ignore. He, if you if you ignore him, you have to choose to you're choosing to accept that he's going to do whatever he wants. And if mm-hmm. if you can't mitigate his positioning, he's going to eat all your heroes and whatever number of troops that he wants. And the six might, if it's managed well, even if he flubs a combat. That player is not too worried about throwing two might to like make that a six to win the fight and then just roll through whatever they want to. I I, I think Azog is edging it out for me, but I don't know. I'm not I'm not happy that I'm saying that because <laughs> I really it's like inter- Dalamir. It's interesting though because you, your good hero list um, chose Boromir as the top choice, and he has. Fight seven and six points of money, <laughs> uh, and is a is is pretty tough to to get rid of. And I think it's a similar. But obviously, he doesn't have the banner. But Azog, you know, has a similar support for the orcs uh, in the sense that they they're more likely to stick around at the end of the game because of him. And I don't think I, I would ever be very scared of a a, a Dalamir. But like, a, a, it doesn't change how I play into a Corsair list uh, because of Dalamir. Whereas Azog on the table, you really do have to think about where your stuff is. Before Richard casts his vote in defense of uh, of Dalamir, mm. the, the points that you pay for Azog is pretty much the points you pay for Dalamir and a full war band. And so if you think about it, uh, Harry, you brought up that Azog doesn't really buff the troops around him uh, mm. other than um, courage at the end of the game. Well, considering he's always going to be a massive chunk of your points, that's that that's a lot of points you're paying for a hero that could be just transfixed all game. And if if mm-hmm. he is in a situation, if he's facing an opponent that just has him transfixed all game or for most of the game, then you're not getting what you're paying for. While it is hard to ignore Dalamir and full war band of Corsairs. Yeah, that, that's quite compelling because I think I'd back Dalamir in 18 Corsairs to win in a fight against Dazog and win any scenario as well. 
Yeah, that's a that's a strong argument, Charles. But as we know, since Harry has the tiebreaker, I mean, it's, <laughs> I might as well side with the winning side here. There's, there's no point. <laughs> but realistically, like what swayed me for Azog is that if you look at the Pits of Dogledor, a uh, special rule of like the super Palantir, like the <laughs> surprise yeah. ambush. I guess the wording, I just reread it right now. It kind of is attributed to him, right? Because he has to be on the board. So you can kind of, even though it's a legendary legion bonus, you can kind of say it's like part of his profile. And if that's the case, I think having that is definitely a game changer. And you can't really put a value on that. He also gets resistant to magic in that as well, which is big. And it stacks up well with the, the free hero of combats too, right? Like, if you set it up a turn in advance, you can definitely just pinpoint an enemy here and be like, you're dead next turn. Also, just side note, the fact that he is on the White Warg, which is two wounds and has a fade point, that's Mm -hmm. big. A lot of big heroes are on, you know, D4, one wound horses. His does not go away easily, unless it's like a Hurl or a Sorcerer's Blast, and that that is a game changer. It's not like a Lucky Archer is going to get rid of that. Yeah, that's a good point. We did, we sort of mentioned that he was six might. He isn't six might. It's just that he's he's so often got his uh, his white wild. And we didn't mention the big mountain that he can bring with him as well. You know, that's that's a pretty yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty cool addition. It's cool, but maybe more of a meme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if he's got that, I think Dalamir takes it. <laughs> All right. So the the next matchup is between two heroes that probably couldn't be more different. And we have Grima Wormtongue versus the Watcher in the Water. I'm just imagining these two actually showing up and fighting each other. Yeah. My choice doesn't look good in this, does it? <laughs> Not much I mean, of a fight between them. I mean, yeah. if you can argue if Grima's around, then uh, the Watcher can't even use his might. That's true. That is true. <laughs> I... Also, the Watcher can't target Grima because... Uh, you know he's he's on their side so so in a in a straight up fight the watcher's never going to be able to kill grimmer they're just both going to be standing there looking at each other for the whole game and the watcher can't do anything with his might point either so you know it's a like, win well it's a draw but <laughs> grimmer's special rule only affects heroic actions yeah that's right yeah yeah the, the watcher's weakness definitely has to be mentioned firstly he has to be in his own warband he always deploys by himself later on in the game uh, and only on a roll of a two up with uh, that can't be mited. So three up. it's a three up actually, which is way more brutal. Yeah, three up. Yeah, so it can be really brutal. But on the other hand, Grima, you need to take Sarman, who isn't on the top 16. He's not seen as like the top tier kind of hero that you take in every Isengard list. So that is a big tax. The other thing is that there are magical powers and other special rules that can take him right out of the game. And so Grima is, even though you can't target him, he isn't invulnerable. Um, so there are ways to just get rid of him as well. So the difference is that the Watcher, I think you you build your list around him because he's so expensive, right? He is your centerpiece, while Grima is kind of more of a hero that brings tricks. So I'm going to say that the watcher has the edge and maybe because it's he's my pick but <laughs> I, oh my. I i've just seen games and also played a few games where your opponent has nothing that can stop him and they just have no answer to his tentacles and in the given right situations he's the mvp and he wins the game for you yeah i can see grima doing that too but maybe not to that extreme I'm going to disagree a little bit with you more about the list building thing. Like, like you said, like if you're taking a watcher, you're building a list around the watcher, but if you're taking Grima, you have to take Saruman. So you're building a list around Saruman because he's, he's 200 points, right? Or just under 200 points, which is basically the same cost as the watcher. And yeah, you need a bat to make the watcher the most effective, but even if you don't have the bat, the watcher is happy just to sit behind the front line and pick off, three enemy troops a turn and it can happily do that every turn provided you roll okay enough on your to hit rolls right uh or number of shots and there's just more ways to neutralize grima added on to the fact that it is only heroic actions that his thing affects now mm-hmm. that, that that's not as good as it used to be like last edition 
where it was everything. He, he turned three Might Heroes into one Might Heroes, and that was insane. I think he's he's in a very, very nice spot right now. He's very well balanced. He's still you're probably going to take him every chance you can, but he's not like in crazy good like he used to be. And just like for those reasons, I think I think the Watcher edges it out for me. And, and it comes down to the Watcher. Just both of them change the way you play against like if you're playing against it but the watcher is is bigger because it's so much harder to shut down yeah i'm uh, sadly i'm 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 gonna have to i think i'm gonna have to back back the watcher as well it's, it's just silly because he's uh, grim is my choice isn't he but um it's just it, you, i think everything you guys have said is 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 completely right i, I think the the value of uh, of taking points of mind away isn't quite the same as sort of assassinating that hero instantly anyway you know that that hero you're you're draining a point extra point of might off per heroic action is just not as good as being able to whip him over the the lines into a bat and instantly kill him it's just it's just really good and there's there's not a lot i've i've played against the watch quite a, a few times now and i still haven't come up with an effective strategy to to beat it with any of my armies i just don't know how <laughs> other than just leaving my heroes really far back and hoping that my line beats it, their line so that's kind of it yeah i do think that grima probably has a lot more weaknesses aside from the magic mm -hmm. if people really do commit a couple warriors to just pin them in a trap every single turn that's roughly the same value so you could get into that situation so yeah I, I think as much as like grima like i like his tricks and stuff i think there's a reason why like for a whole year i ran like a basically an 800 point like watcher list that did pretty well for me in some of the biggest tournaments here so mm. yeah i think i think i have to give it to watcher sorry grima <laughs> Okay, next we have Suladan, the Serpent Lord, versus Rutabi. Okay, should we just 4 0 this? <laughs> <laughs> not yeah, fair, Rutabi man. wins 4 0, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not fair. Like any other matchup, she'd have a, like, a much better comparison. Ugh. Okay, Ugh. Ian, Ian, since this is your pick, if you were to make a case for Rutabi, what would be your arguments? Um, my case is I can't vote against two of my first picks that show up on the list. <laughs> I, I, three up master of battle is fantastic. Fight six heroes, fight six plus heroes are rare for the evil side. Besides now in uh, Easterlings where they have three, well, technically four, I guess, if you're playing Kamul. She's just so solid. Honestly, for 110 points, she's very reliable. Three up master of battle forces you to play around her and supports the army she can kill heroes you know if she can get the trap on it she like doubles or rerolls failed to wound rolls so she can put out damage that way and honestly just fills a very big gap in the easterling list where they used to be might deficient and she brings three might for 110 points which is good and then there's the three of master of battle which is fantastic it's a case where and then, then add on all the other special rules that she has you're not mad that she's on foot Based on the points cost and the uh, like, the phalanx and the unyielding combat stance and the being able to reroll, she she can do everything you need her to. Um, is she a free six inch banner level of effectiveness? Maybe not, but still very very effective. So I'm gonna vote for her despite you all. Wow. Okay. Oh, oh this this could this be a big upset? <laughs> could, could, I, I have I have the, I have the power to. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I will I will back some of your arguments there, Ian, because um, back in the back in the pre Dragon Emperor, but post Ratabi Brawl Gear days, Ratabi was absolutely fantastic for the Easterling army. Like like you said, the the bring the the might was always such a problem when I was running um, Easterling because Kamul only came with two points of might, and then you probably have Amda, and then you've got Dragon Knights, or have only got two, but they've got Blundell, and then a Captain that's only got two. So they, they just there was this like awkward points level where you you ended up with like five or six or you know not not very many um points of might and she just absolutely filled that gap by going yeah you got a three point uh might uh hero with strike who also has master of battle it was so so big um and then the dragon emperor came along and basically just said no i'm just 
like so much better. I kind of miss that that sweet spot with them um, where the Easterlings felt like they weren't an insta pick because of the Dragon Emperor, but they had that extra utility that Brawgear and uh, Ratabi brought. They were it was a really really nice time to be an Easterling player, um, and and Ratabi was a big part of the reason for that. So I, I am very very tempted to to put a vote in for Ratabi, but Suladan just has to take it, doesn't he? He's 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 just so good. You, there's a reason why you see him in in so many armies. There's so much so much that he offers harry i'm just wondering if you did pick rutabi would you lose your position in the gbhl <laughs> <laughs> i think i think i would have to uh, quit them out of the committee yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> all right so we have gothmog now versus mm. the generic ring wraith very interesting matchup again okay. two very different heroes so I guess I should start by uh, my, my impassioned defense of Gothmog against a Ringwraith. I think this is actually a, a, a bit more of a toss-up than it could have been. Gothmog could have been up against uh, some much more valuable heroes. But um, I mean, here, you know, you can... Gothmog's uh, Hero of Valor, Hero of Legend in the, the Legion. So he's got that going for him. He's got a lot uh, lot to offer. And, you know, we've just bigged up Ritabi's uh, Master of Battle, but Gothmog's the OG, right? He, he's the first person to have Master of Battle. And it's the proper Master of Battle where you don't have to roll a dice... Uh, you just get it, which is really cool. You know, he's one of those heroes that I, I just think that he's not one of those ones that people are necessarily scared by, but he can certainly do some work. Like he, he's got uh, a solid number of attacks uh, and, you know, good strength. And and he's got those uh, slight buffs against men, which I mentioned earlier when when we uh, uh, when I introduced him as my pick that that can be really useful at the moment in the meta as it is. There's there's a lot of a lot of armies, um, both good and evil, which uh, include men, and most of them are very good armies. You know, whether it's um, Suladan and his serpent horde dudes, whether it's um, a black Numenorian um, front line, whether it's Numenorians with the uh, with the Rivendell, uh, or whether it's Corsairs. There's just there's, there's just quite a uh, Lake Town as well. You know, there's just quite a lot of. Uh, armies where that little bubble of um, effectiveness of killing power for your Moranans can really, really help. So I, I, I like that pick for, uh, for that reason. And and of course, he's got this uh, 12 inch reroll wounds thing that he can pop off uh, once per game. For the price, you get a lot for him. Um, but but he also sort of uh, slips under the radar, which I think is probably why, you know, you guys were a little disparaging when I mentioned him as being my pick because uh, he's I think he's undervalued. Um, he's one of those heroes that but yeah, you're not scared by, but but will be quietly be doing solid work throughout the game. So so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to vote for Gothmog because because you know he's he's my pick. I've got to back one of them at least. <laughs> you know how Richard at the beginning said you know he's considered sort of like an average mid tier hero, and the reason why I think that is is because um, you're paying for a lot of combat oriented stats like the the three attacks, and while he's just like a Fight five, which you know, a lot of fight five, three attack heroes we know have the fight value as their weakness in the current meta because there are so many warriors that are now fight five. And the other thing is you're taking him for the master of battle, which means that I think it would be more suitable if he was if he was like in a support role and not necessarily be like the combat hero to charge in. But since you are paying for his stats then you kind of do want him to fight but due to his fight five he's not like great he costs so much you kind of want to risk him in combat and I, I just think that it's hard to get the most out of him my vote for would go for the ring wraith here because i think that ring wraith is very versatile he brings a lot of utility and warband space for the amount that he can cost if you go for like a, a cheap build he can bring a uh, heroic march so you don't have to take the or captain like richard said earlier so yeah there's just a lot of things you can do with the ring wraith and he doesn't have the as great like of a of special rules or heroic actions as the witch king but point for point uh you're you're building from like the same base profile so very cost efficient ian what are your thoughts you're looking like this is a hard decision it's tricky do you know where you're going i yeah, think i'm I know gonna back going. my pick of course <laughs> All right, well, that was easy for you. <laughs> I was leading towards the Ring Wraith. And now I've opened up Gothmog's profile and I'm looking at it. And he does have the holy trinity of heroic actions. Strike, defense, and march. 
that's pretty nice. Yeah. I, uh, and the generic ring wraith is very good because it brings them arch and it brings warband slots, but it's only hero fortitude, right? Mm. I don't know, man. I'm I'm leaning towards Gothmog. Um, yes, go Gothmog. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I, heroic defense is pretty solid as well. You know, he he can last his uh, last his time. You know, I mean, you mentioned the fight value being being an issue for charging into big heroes, but I mean, you can just charge into a big hero heroic defense a few times while calling your master of battle moves to uh, to keep your keep your army chomping. Um, so you know, he, I, I realize he's not going to be chopping through an elven spear line very uh, very quickly, but you know, he can he can grind. It's not a lot of evil heroes that have it. Yeah. Outside like the Hashrin and Dalamir, I think. You guys but bring you... up a good good argument with the heroic actions. My only counter to that is if you're waiting for your enemy to call heroic actions so you can master a battle it, are you mm -hmm. going to be able to call your own? I mean, he's still cheap enough. You're, you're gonna have other orcs around him that can that can buff him, right? And and bring the cheap might. And that's that's the other thing is because he has the orc keyword and the mortar keyword, you can bring a shaman or Kardush with him, and he's going to be auto passing courage tests too. So even late game, yeah, we said the ring wraith was good because it passes courage tests and keeps your arm on the board. So does Gothmog, and after like once you break, like you said, he's not the most valuable combat piece. He doesn't have to be in combat to have his effective rightness, right? He just mm -hmm. has to be near enemy heroes to get that master of battle buff going off. If he's doing that and he's also just giving a big stand fest because he's next to a shaman, he he's you know he's he's doing his points worth more or less. Like you said, even though he ha like he has three attacks, he's not a, he's not a damage output hero really, right? He doesn't have he's only strength four. He doesn't have any plus ones to wounds or anything. I mean, well, I guess against men he does he he kind of turns into that role a bit. But when he's capped at fight five, he's just there to munch troops, and if heroes get into him, he's going to stall him. Or if they're fight five, you know, do they spend the might to strike against him or not? I don't know. Or he can just defense and walk away. I just think he has more utility. And maybe he's a little underplayed in these lists because Mordor just is flush with choices now. Yeah. So I I, I think I'm going to go for Gothmog, but like it is a tough call. Ooh. All right, there you go. <laughs> You got the win there, Harry. <laughs> yeah. So that. So yeah. Uh, by definition, I get the get the win. All right. So the next matchup, we have the two hundred point Dragon Emperor versus the two hundred point Golovar. Ooh, yeah. Of course, they're the same points now. Interesting. I hate that this is my last pick, and he's going up against the Dragon Emperor. I hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> well, my argument stays the same. When Golovar is on the table. Your play style changes completely. Hmm. When the Dragon Emperor on the, is on the table, you just go, "Ugh, I don't like that guy. He's undercosted." Well, he was undercosted. <laughs> like, I think he's still if, pretty undercosted. I mean, assuming that changing the way your opponent is forced to play the game is worth a lot, then I think Gully wins. <laughs> it's not much of a margin, but you know what? I'm 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 going to go with what Richard said. I'm standing by my pick. I think. Um... At 170 points, this would have been a landslide for me. Now it's much closer at 200 points for the Dragon Emperor. I don't know. I, I think I still might lean a little bit towards that way just because I think in the Good Heroes episode, we when we talk about like the top cream of the crop heroes, they always have to be able to have um, effects on the warriors beside them. If they just have like killing power, then that leaves you to more weaknesses and more like times that you could get shut down. Like Gulivar, if you come up against like legless or and heavy shooting, especially now after the the previous FAQ, you know you could be in for a rough time. Or you play against something like Corsairs, where they have like mass evil shooting, ready to like shoot into combat. You're gonna have a rough time in those matchups. You you just will really struggle and against siege weapons too, right? Without without fate, you just get one shotted. Um, whereas I think the Dragon Emperor, a lot of the times, if he doesn't even fight one combat during a game, he could still win the game for you. So I think that's like the power of like the buffs. Oh. I mean, in in defense to, to some of the points you've just made, then you know, Gulivar does does bring some bonuses for the troops in the sense that he's a spirit model and it causes them 
uh, to get Terra and the big base uh, can help with that a bit. Granted, Gulliver is likely to be hopping backwards and forwards, so he's not sort of standing um, in the in the line like a Barrow White would be to to provide that constant buff. But but also you you, you pointed out siege weapons. Siege weapons are the number one thing to uh, uh, frustrate the Dragon Emperor as well. So so you know if you're coming up against the siege weapon of either of these heroes, you're not in a particularly happy state of affairs, and especially. You know, Gulliver being quicker in, in some ways, um, he, he has the has the advantage there against uh, the Dragon Emperor. You know, you're probably only going to get a couple of turns of uh, of shooting at the Gulliver before before you know he gets destroyed. Whereas Dragon Emperor loses so many of those buffs from the uh, from being knocked off his palanquin. So, I mean, it, it it's obviously hard to defend um, the the Gulliver against uh, Dragon Emperor, but I mean. I, if I'm completely honest, if I come up against either of these armies, I think I'm less worried by the Dragon Emperor. I probably won against it less than the, than against Gulliver. Um, but equally, there's just like it, it's maybe it's just because it's not that fun to play against. Um, in the sense that it's just a grind fest. Gulliver at least at least provides lots of as as Ian's already mentioned, lots of interesting choices. Um, and lots of sort of tactical kind of chess chess moves. Oh, do I, you move that there? You move this here. Oh, I, whereas Dragon Emperor, oh, push push lines forward, fill gap, don't die until end game. You've got the higher fight. You've got the big banner, Hazar. And he's just got so many resistant magical resistance. He's just got everything. And it's yeah, I, I really want to vote for Gulliver, but the, I get I, I I realize that would put it to a draw, and then I that I, I'm responsible for um, putting Gulliver above Dragon Emperor. So I I, I kind of have to go <laughs> with the Dragon Emperor. I see you laughing there. Ian. <laughs> it's interesting because I think this is the only matchup where they're they're they cost the same mm. in, in points. I think everyone has made a, made great points. How the Dragon Emperor edges out for me is that when. When Gulivar is placed in your army, you are kind of more worried that he's going to be killed or go down because you're likely going to throw him in and mm. you're going to depend a lot on his hero combats, on his hurls. The Dragon Emperor, he's most likely going to be your leader. He is safe in his palaquin, most likely behind two ranks of pikes. You know, he's in both armies. If you lose that hero, you're in big trouble. And I just think Gulivar is going to die a lot more than the Dragon mm. Emperor. They're very close, though. This is basically like like a tie for me. But yeah, That was the hardest decision of all of them, I think, so far. Okay, and the final matchup of the first round is the Mumak War Leader versus the Mahood King. Mm -hmm. Well, in a straight-up fight, the Mumak War Leader takes, takes the win, right? I mean, the Mahood King has, has one measly Impaler hit. The Mumak War Leader has four strength nine uh, triple hit. <laughs> Uh, you know, obviously, four hundred points for a Mumak War Leader, and that's without any of the guys in the Howder, uh, is a big deal. Uh, that's a lot of points to spend. But I mean, he's a linchpin to an army, and and I think if it wasn't for the terrain factor of of the Mumak War Leader just just being awkward to to use in uh, some battlefields, I think I think we'd see a lot more of him. As a hero legend, you can deploy guys in or out of the Howder, so you know he he can work quite well at lowish points as well because that, that you know people just can't deal with him uh, at really low points. But yeah, there's basically just you know you lose a roll off and you know the the Mumak surrounded and, and trapped. Um, but here you know often the the thing that can kill the Mumuk is, is you know, your, your big enemy leader because he's got a, a, a strike and resilience, you know, high defense, a lot of fate, that sort of stuff. Here, the Mumuk has a little answer to that with the, the Legion bonus of having the free heroic strike against the enemy leader. So your enemy's like, oh, do I want to put my leader into it or do I not? And, uh, and you know, then there's the, uh, you know, I, I just think and the high, high, much higher courage than the normal Mumuks means it's much less likely to uh, go on a stampede. So so I think, it, it, granted, Mumuks have always been um, a, a sort of weird and uh, wonderful choice rather than a sort of competitive pick. But I think this profile really fixes a lot of the big downsides to a standard Mumuk and makes him actually really, a uh, really decent choice. If you've got a Mumuk war leader with, you know, blood of bows in the howder and then something on the ground, you know, that can hit hard, then it can potentially do well. I know it has won the occasional tournament and I've done certainly very well with it. So I, I'm going to I'm going to back my, my pick here, even though I really do like a Mahood King. Yeah, Dane-sized damage at 95 points 
while also still giving a courage buff is really hard to ignore. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't in a pure list, then I'd probably give it to the Mumak leader, but I think giving that courage boost to like the Mahud list is huge. And the fact that you can take more than one of them is also big. Charles has run that list before with two Mahud Kings and Suladan, and it is nasty. It's just like I know obviously, like, you know, damage output isn't everything. Well, in that list, damage output is everything, and it does it very well. <laughs> So I, I think I got to go Mahud King, but you know the War Leader he is definitely the most effective way to run a Mumak. I would say. Yeah, I think the War Leader is definitely underrated. Um, before it came out, kind of just looked at Mumax as kind of a meme army, but uh, War Leader is pretty legit. The Mahud King does edge it out for me because just the flexibility of it. You play it pure, you can play an alliance, and just. The efficiency of it it's it's hard i know you like your big heroes harry but it's it's really hard for me to pick like i guess these like 300 point plus models and and i mean i give it that it is really hard to balance right <laughs> so yeah harry it's the first thing you said you know it's if terrain was not an issue unfortunately i've seen many games and experienced many games uh, where a Mumak just wasn't able to uh, get to a, a target or a terrain piece that it needs to. And unfortunately, um, the buffs that the war leader provides over a regular Mumak doesn't help in getting past terrain. So mm -hmm. um, just, I don't know. I, I want to play with the war leader. He's so much fun. But in terms of um, being like a versatility, I think it's got to be Mahood King. It's a shame because it's even little things like the lack of rappling lines on the Mimic War Leader. You can't add rappling lines, which means you, you know, you're often struggling to get the objectives and and stuff like that. So yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think we're on to the quarterfinals mm -hmm. for this round. Since I feel like we've kind of discussed every single hero pretty in depth here, I think mm -hmm. we could go pretty quick with the the picks here. So. Yeah. Just which hero in general you like better. All right. So the Witch King versus Spider Queen. Okay. Before people go, I, like I said, Spider Queen has just is the most amazing hero for me and has won me too many games. I, I feel like I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, especially recently. It seems like the UK, especially just, a lot of people seem to think that the Witch King somehow is overpowered and needs a nerf. I personally don't see it that way. Like, I see how amazing he is. He's really flexible. But at the same time, I don't see him as being broken. And I think he's just very efficient and flexible. So that's why you see him a lot. But I enjoy the, the special rules and, like, taking your opponent off guard. The toolkit that the Spider Queen brings. So I'm going to go with her. I'm going to go with uh, the Witch King, not just because the Witch King's so ace, but also I, I just don't really rate the Spider Queen. I mean, maybe maybe I've I've not uh, not played against her enough and been on her, you know, the bad side of her. But yeah, it's got to be the Witch King for me. I'm going to go Spider Queen. Oh, wait, no, Charles didn't vote yet. Oh, oh, oh! Do I do it? Yeah, fuck it. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's just like shooting broodlings 23 inches is pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Witch King is so good, though. Like, with the you know, crown, it's... You know, I, I thought Ian was going to go Witch King, so I was going to say Spider Queen. I thought I was Charles like... was going to go Witch King, so I was going to say Spider Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's rock paper scissors, Char. No, oh, we're oh. we've 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 already made um, some people mad with our picks. <laughs> no going back anyway. The, the engagement of this video is going to go off the charts, and it's not even intentional. Yeah, so I know I know the Witch King is like a lot of people's favorites, and he is a centerpiece <laughs> on a lot of uh, people's lists. And the Morgul Crown is amazing. Just my personal play style, I like a skewed list over a balanced list. So I like these heroes that are kind of like offbeat. They have like 
unique abilities and they, they just i just gravitate towards these picks more and when it comes to facing witch kings i've never had a witch king just like roll over me while well, i've had a spider queen roll over me so this is really weird upset i didn't expect this to happen very <laughs> stunned I, I, oh I am. God. I am. So I thought there was a big butt coming right at the end of that, but no, it, you it's just happening. went with it. The Spider Queen wins. This is this is it's crazy. Happening. Everybody stay no, calm. Was... What the fuck is going on? You're you're betraying your viewers and listeners here, you know, because that is their number one pick. What was it? Sixty five percent of the the people voted, or sixty five votes was it? Yeah, and the, and they're all wrong. <laughs> put it put it on the title cards. Really make everybody mad. Yeah, yeah. Join, if you want real content, listen to Entmu. We back you, community. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh wow, Charles, oh, what have man. we done? What have I done? <laughs> yeah, this is interesting. Hey, but you I think voted this for me- Spider Queen too. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think it comes down to what like that last point that you made though is like I've said this point many times, but when I look at the table and I see a witch king, I say, oh, it's an annoying caster who can fight he's very efficient absolutely he's very good and he works on a lot of lists but when you see the spider queen you kind of go oh fuck how do i deal with that mm. and then anyway later on in the game she just shoots out broodlings and spoils all your plans anyway or you know like richard has done this in the last turn like spat out broodlings and randomly captured an objective and domination and won a game from that so is that, i mean is I, that I don't know just... if i'm happy about it but is, is that just familiarity sort of uh, breeding contempt there? You know, that the Witch King is just so often on opposite on the table that you don't really, you know, you don't really sort of get intimidated by it. But uh, because know, the Spider Queen, you know, maybe it's something I'll, to that. I'll, that's fair enough. All right. I can't wait to hear the comments. <laughs> We're so mad. I think the Aussies will back us. <laughs> they hate the Spider Queen too, I, I don't, don't they? they? Hate Spider Queen. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> All right, so let's see if um, we can top that controversial pick. Uh, next, we have Azog against the Watcher in the Water. I can go first since um, you guys already know that in the previous round, I wasn't entirely impressed with Azog as much as I, I believe I was alone in, in picking down here. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to back Watcher here again. This is similar to the last match where I, I'm I gravitate towards the model that has like the unique ability and and something that's that's like hard to deal with over the raw stat line beat stick which i guess that's not entirely true azog has utility too with um in pits and master battle outside the legion but i i just think a watcher in the hands of a good player i think it can be unbeatable sometimes i'll go next as probably I don't know about Harry's experience, but probably out of the guys, other guys here, I've played the Watcher the most. I think I actually do like Azog a little bit better here just because of the consistency. The Watcher, the the three up arrival with, and you can't boost it with your one might is actually a huge detriment because he will eventually show up. But sometimes if it's by the third turn, you probably have a big chance of losing the game and then also a big counter actually which is quite common is blinding light if you can't hit with your tentacles then you're actually going to struggle quite a bit and also like um, i don't know if this is as big of a negative but i think the learning curve is a lot bigger um i've seen a lot of players um also pick up the watcher because um definitely a really fun and cool looking model but then um, they're always surprised at how fast it dies. It does have six wounds. It doesn't have strike. You know, it's a massive base, so you can trap it really easily. If you get a couple heroes, even like foot heroes into it, you strike up, you trap it, it can go down really quick. So in a sense, that makes Azog a little better too, just being able to get value out of it a little easier. I- I'm going to just base this entirely on my own experiences. Um, I- I- I'm usually uh, as someone who takes like a big a big hitter like a big uh, uh, you know an Elendil or or something like that and my army sort of built around that character at the moment i'm running uh, uh, imrahil with um uh, with the uh, dolamroth guys so um something like azog isn't as 
perhaps intimidating as something like the watcher like i can play around as i can sort of at least have a have, have a pop against it but the watcher with a, a combined with a the bat there's just not really much that it, it completely neutralizes most of the armies that i like to play i don't often have uh, a blinding light kicking about and um, so, so for me, just in terms of, I, I played a, a couple of games against the Watcher. Uh, uh, one guy in the UK, uh, Jordan O'Brien, shout out to Jordan. He's uh, very, very well uh, practiced with with the Watcher, and it's really hard to come up against. So, I think I think my vote would go for the Watcher, um, uh, based on just just how annoying I find it uh, to come up against. And as of, while very strong and very powerful, I always think at least I've got a chance. You know, there's there's something that I can do. Whereas the watcher for me just you know i can't i just don't have a much of a of a counter to it really so so yeah i'll go watcher yeah the name that you brought up actually a uh, shout out to jordan i think i remember it was about a year ago i think he uh he messaged me and then he wanted to talk some uh, watcher talk so oh nice <laughs> <laughs> glad to see him uh, doing well in the uk with it oh yeah he's doing really well with it yeah i guess my vote doesn't really matter here but i think this is tough. I think I'm going to go with the Watcher, though, because it can put you in that no-win situation where if it, provided it has a bat swarm with it and he's sitting behind the line in that little trap, mm. you can set it up basically so that it's if you put any heroes within that radius, he's going to grab that hero and suck it and kill that hero. If you don't put any heroes in that radius, he's going to sit there and kill two or three troops a turn, and he's going to overrun that section of the battle line anyway and break your line and there's nothing you can do about that it's just that's just going to happen yeah and as good as azog is he can't do something like that he can't force your opponent into just like sacrificing part of their battle line agreed all right so harry do you have a defense for this or are you gonna swing the other um my impassioned defense of gothmog ends here <laughs> uh, i love gothmog but um yeah Soladan soladan has gotta take it hasn't he sadly he's just so so efficient even i own a Soladan. <laughs> <laughs> no i'm gonna defend gothmog's honor Ian. <laughs> because he has heroic defense over Soladan. In the last FAQ, and because we're the lost. ability, you can bash now. According to the last FAQ, so yeah, Bye. there you go. <laughs> Who needs damage out where we can knock people over? So you and you're going with uh, Gothmog? Yeah, just because. No reason, just because. <laughs> All right, Ian, Ian picks really odd hills to die on. I've, I'm given the responsibility of the additional uh, the tiebreaker vote. I think I have more responsibility here to to not follow my heart. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> mine's mine's much easier because sometimes it doesn't matter like that one. <laughs> if you picked Gothmog, then people will also tune off and move. <laughs> <laughs> Final match in this round is the Dragon Emperor against the Mahood King. Even as a big Mahood King fan and someone who's played Mahood King for like 10 tournaments, I have have to go Dragon Emperor. Even um, after the recent update, I think uh, Dragon Emperor just is is so, so good value. And I mean, Mahood King is too, but the Dragon Emperor kind of does everything, you know. He's good in combat. He's a good support hero. He's a good leader. Uh, just he just has it all. Yep. I'm going to I'm going to throw my vote um, in for the Mahood King just because um, I, I just don't I just don't think the Dragon Emperor is a very interesting thing to play against, whereas the Mahood King is. So I'm. I'm not dying on this hill, but I respect you, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad you said that because it would be awkward if uh, the Dragon Emperor dropped out here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a spicy match up next for the semifinals. Um, I like it. Semifinals. First match is the Spider Queen versus the Watcher in the Water. Funny thing is, this was basically my list. <laughs> 
I think I, I'm going to cast my vote pretty much straight away for the Watcher. I've I've not backed the Spider Queen at all. <laughs> I know you guys seem to really rate her. Maybe there's just not very many of them kicking around in the UK, and and that means that I've just I've only played it once a long time ago, and that was a pure Spider Army. So maybe I haven't seen the raw potential of the Spider Queen, but the Watcher for me, I just I just, I just don't know how to play against it. So so I just I, yeah, I, I'd much prefer to play a Spider Queen. There's at least some counters. I'm going to go Spider Queen. Yeah, I think me too I, here. Both of them can bring the bat, right? So it's they both have the same strength in that they can kill. They can one shot a hero with the bat. Hmm. The Watcher has the, 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 the no one proposition like I just talked about before. The Spider Queen has crazy mobility. Not it, it's not flying, but it's it's basically flying. And it can be better in some situations because if you want to, you can just run her on top of a building and nobody can touch her for a turn, right? Mm -hmm. You can't really do that with some flying models or run her into a forest and there's nothing they can do. This is a tough one, but... The only thing I'd say is yeah. that, you know, obviously the, the Spider Queen does provide that mobility and the, the Broodlings are ace for, you know, sending people off the board, but like that solves some of the problems in some of the at the armies that... Uh, you know, maybe you wouldn't necessarily have as much mobility in any way. But I think a lot of armies, you still throw in a couple of cavalry or some wags or whatever it is anyway to to try and deal with that problem. So uh, in some ways, if you're relying on the Spider Queen to do that, it, it it could, to provide that mobility, it could go really wrong if you, you know, if you get shot early early doors or, or you know, and you, you roll badly on your broodling wound thing and end up killing your spider queen. I think that's possible. You know, th those sorts of things. I think relying on something like that for the mobility might be a little bit risky when you could just add a cavalry model or a, another fast model into the, the game for, for your seize the prize or for your recon or whatever it is that you're using it for. So, yeah. It's kind of like a cost thing, though. Like, it's, you can have a spider queen and a bat in there and still build another kind of list. But when you're building a list with the watcher, you're you're building a list with the watcher, right? Yeah. Yeah. True. True. This is tough. The watcher has games where, like, your game just depends on the watcher's role, like either his role to come on the board or his role for number of shots. Like, if you roll one shot, like two turns in a row, I think. That's just 200 points of not doing anything. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, Richard's nodding. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> While Spider Queen can also flub a roll, she doesn't need to roll anything to put down the broodlings. It's guaranteed. And, and also the swift movement 10 inches with the monster's charge is, uh, is pretty scary. There is a way that she can get wounded by the broodlings, though, right? What's what? What is that? Is that right? Or am I imagining it? No, no. Yeah. I think you, you might be thinking of um, is it like she lob like getting wounded? She has to take a courage test. Yeah. Spider Queen you, doesn't have that. Are you no. thinking of enraged beast? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I I don't know where I got that from then. So there's no there's no way that you can fail getting the broodlings. No, unless you it's use just a your will point. to resist a spell or something. Yeah. And um, God, is that it? And and like the threat range so is basically twenty four inches, which is oh yeah, because you get the base size too. Yeah, which is a lot oh, better God, than yeah. most cavalry models. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, may maybe I should change my vote then. I thought there was some sort of downside. One of us. One of us. But um, <laughs> it looks like he's gonna win anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so I I love the Watcher, and I wanted the Watcher to make it into the finals, but. I think Spider Queen gets gets this. I just just that threat range is just I mean, insane. There is a reason you see a lot more Spider Queens popping up in lists rather than Watchers, right? The Watcher's still very good, but I was going to say you can't you can't just drop the Watcher in with that because the Watcher is is nothing without the bat, and because the you need to ally yeah. something else, and you're having to get like Durbers or something to yeah. ally the Watcher. Yeah, so it's and, just not going to work. And then it? half your list has to be goblins, which are not the greatest, right? Yeah. Even though they bring, they're cheap. They're just, they're not good. Yeah. All right. So the other semifinals match is Suladan versus the Dragon Emperor. the 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 battle, battle of the banners. banners. <laughs> uh, I don't know, guys. I mean, the Dragon Emperor was just nerfed, so clearly Sully wins this, right? Right. Um. Yes. Next question. Who needs fight five? 
Yeah. I mean, so 200 points five. versus what, 125? 115. 115. <laughs> well, 115. 120 if you give him the bow, but that's... Yeah. Does anybody give him the bow? Some people do. I mean, the um, FAQ just came out, so we don't have any examples of how, you know, players going to a tournament paying the extra 30 points for the Dragon Emperor. Yeah. I think what at 170, it's clear for the Dragon Emperor, but I think with just, I guess, going off of the gut feeling, again, we don't have any data right now of the new Dragon Emperor. I, I think I might prefer Soladan here. Mm, interesting. I'm going to disagree and I'm going to go Emperor because like like for both of them, you, like Emperor pre-nerf, you were happy if you're sitting in a game and he was just behind your line giving you the buffs. He wasn't doing anything combat. Same thing for Soladan. Even after the nerf, he still has that six inch fight five bonus plus a 12 inch banner. So I still think you're okay with him sitting behind the line, just existing and being a leader who's not getting wounded. That's not to say Sully isn't amazing. Sully is amazing for his points cost. Mm -hmm. I just think the dragon emperor is proportionally the same thing, but he is bigger and he just does more. Harry, you want to go or do you want me to? Well, I, I I'm, I'm happy to, to let you go first, just in case. <laughs> I don't know. He I would, I what, really he's don't saying, know. what he's saying is that your vote doesn't matter, Charles. So <laughs> you should go. <laughs> no, it's not that. No, no, it isn't. Um, it is. It is hard to be given the responsibility of this, though. It's quite. It's quite intimidating. The added thirty points. You, you're losing three and a bit models, and I don't know whether that would make much difference to the to the, to the list. I mean. It might. It, it could could be the difference between breaking and not breaking, and therefore winning or losing. I don't know. It's just, you see, you see Suladan everywhere, but I just, I just can't help but think the Dragon Emperor is the better, better of the two. I, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm really torn by this. They both have such, you know, the the banner is so big um, for both of them. It's so important to the list that they bring it to. I'm predicting that the first few months after the FAQ, there'll be an illusion that Suladan's better because people usually, well, some people will stay away from a profile that's just recently been nerfed. So mm -hmm. I think that we're going to see more Suladans in the coming months. But I think Suladan has the advantage of being a cheaper hero, meaning that you can put him in more lists. He has also more green alliances. Yeah, I think there are three green alliances that you can do. So I think the versatility of being uh, like 115 points means that when it comes to list building, he'll be the definite better choice. The Dragon Emperor is like, you know, his cost went up, even though it's not by much. It, it, people are going to lean harder into the Legion now. It's going to be harder to bring him into an alliance. And yeah, it's it, it's hard. I'll go with Suladan. Uh, so it does leave it down to me to decide. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think I'm going to have to go with the Dragon Emperor. I just have to. I like. I just don't think it. The, I just think the nerf wasn't enough to make him make that legion worse. Like it just. Just don't. I don't think it makes enough. Um, enough of a difference to me. So, yeah. Sorry to be back in the dragon emperor, but you know, we got it. It's got to be done. I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you ready for the finals? Yeah. In, in the finals of who is the best evil hero. We have the Spider Queen against the Dragon Emperor. Can we all just take a moment to appreciate that the Witch King and Soledad aren't here? I think that's amazing. Yeah, that's great. I'm amazed. Are there any British viewers still watching? <laughs> <laughs> I'd still be back in your hair. I think I think these are great choices to be the top. I think either of these could easily be crowned the the best evil hero, and I don't think many people will have quibbles with it i think personally i i've i've not backed the spider queen at all throughout the whole thing and you guys have so i'm gonna go with the dragon emperor i've backed the dragon emperor in pretty much all the races so it seems silly not to here i just think the the that any list with the with the well basically the dragon emperor legion um which is basically the only way to take it now is going to beat most of the spider queen's armies that the that it's it's fighting up against so 
yeah, obviously the Spider Queen can do some janky stuff and could could disrupt the lines or could could assassinate the Dragon Emperor or could beat it in lots of different things. But there's just so many things in the Easterling list now that that make it so hard to win in most of the objective based scenarios and in, in in the killing scenarios. I just yeah, I just I just don't don't see a, a place where the Emperor Legion would would really really struggle against a Spider Queen list. The funny thing is that. Our uh, finale last year on the West Coast here, Clash on the Coast, We uh, <laughs> the, the top table final game was uh, Witch King Spider Queen list versus uh, Dragon Legion. And <laughs> we, we know who came out on top, but I mean, that it's, it's hard to say both great players and both really strong armies. I, I think as much as I love the Spider Queen, I think... I also might have to go Dragon Emperor here because like I said earlier, just the aura always being able to affect your warriors is such great value. It's so hard to shut down. I think very similarly, as much as I like the Spider Queen, I think if Suladan had made the finals over the Dragon Emperor, I think I would have gone Suladan here as well for the same reason. Ooh, interesting. Now, before you guys cast your two votes, rather than me having the deciding vote, I'm going to roll a die if there's a draw. So, you know, if you really want the Spider Queen to win, there is a chance if you both vote for it. Oh, I love I'm throwing that. that out you're, gi- there. you're giving us the suspense now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I think it. I think it adds a lot here. You know, because if if you want to back back the Spider Queen, I don't think it's fair for me to have the final vote here. Yeah. Okay, Charles, I went first last time, so. You can go first this time if you want. It's just a fool's hope. <laughs> uh, I I got to go Dragon Emperor. Just, <laughs> All right. It's fair that I haven't seen as many Spider Queens, so can't. I don't have as much data to to um, go off of, but um, just even even facing both heroes, I. I just think that this Dragon Emperor is more frustrating and more more consistent. As consistent as the Spider Queen is, Dragon Emperor, you know where you're getting. There's very little that your opponent can do about it. So, yeah, like it, so in this matchup, it it I think the Dragon Emperor is just more consistent. Even if he's like flopping in combat, it's it doesn't matter that that. 12 inch banner buff and the and the fight value buff combined is just it's 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 huge. If it didn't count for BPs, maybe that would make a difference, but it does. Mm. And it's yeah. The spider queens can still flop like we like has been mentioned earlier, right? She can still flop and die pretty relatively easily, even despite the heroic defense, right? Mm-hmm. The, the dragon ever doesn't even have to expose himself to that kind of risk and still can earn his points back. I think there would be maybe a closer match against a Dragon Emperor if the Dragon Emperor had like a significant weakness, like because a lot of these great heroes that made it to the semifinals have a weakness. Mm-hmm. The Dragon Emperor just doesn't really. Yeah, defense seven, three points of fate, yeah. fight six, resistance to magic. Shooting. I still yeah. don't understand why he's D seven. That I just... yeah, it doesn't make any sense. D six would be fine. <sighs> yeah. You know, yeah. the funny thing about this is that we wanted to do this episode a lot earlier, but then we were like, maybe we should wait until the FAQ if Dragon Emperor gets nerfed, or otherwise it'll be a boring episode. Well, it was I more guess... contentious. <laughs> I know. <laughs> was it? I, I mean, the Gully was. <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly, if the Spider Queen hadn't beaten the Witch King, I think I'd be backing the Witch King all the way to the final. And and probably if it was the Witch King versus the Dragon Emperor, I think I'd go for the Witch King. I just think the Witch King brings a lot of versatility to the table that the, the Dragon Emperor doesn't. And it's certainly more a more interesting piece to use and play against. But yeah, you can't you can't argue with the uh, the art things there. So. Best hero, best evil hero equals the Dragon Emperor, despite the uh, the nerf, which is mad. Yeah, yeah. Wonder what kind of message that sends. Yeah, four nil as well. Oh, he's completely busted. <laughs> well, let's hope uh, 
Games Workshop is watching this for August. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Big thank you to Harry for coming on to the show and helping us in this bracket. No, you're welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, as you said earlier, I'd be uh, more than more than happy to come back on and and discuss anything in the future. Pretty much, uh, it's been a it's been a pleasure. It's been a hoot. Awesome. Well, thank you all for watching. Look forward to the next episode of Into the West podcast.